Hello and uh, welcome everybody to this OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, we're a little time zone challenge today. I'm doing this live from Bruno in the Czech Republic. So I apologize if my sound quality might not be perfect, but I'm in Red Hat headquarters here and heading off to DEF CONF Czech um, Republic. So there's about 2,000 people signed up to come to this conference tomorrow. So I'm, I'm totally excited to be here. But um, I'm even more psyched to have my good friend Mark Lamarine giving us this presentation today on integrating OpenShift on OpenStack. He's done a, a lot of great things for us in the past on the OpenShift team, and he's going to explain the basics of what our integration story is. And then we'll have Q&A afterwards. Um, if you have questions, put them into the chat room, and then um, we'll, if we can, if he pauses and takes a breath, I may uh, read off the question, but we're going to try and save most of the questions for the end, and um, we should be uh, ready to rock and roll. So, Mark, um, if you would, introduce yourself and um, take it away. All right. Um, as you can see, uh, my name is Mark Lamarine. Uh, I'm a software developer here at Red Hat, and I've been working with some people recently uh, on integration on OpenShift and OpenStack. Um, you can find me just so people know. Uh, I have my, Mark Lama is my, my moniker de guerre. Um, and uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere under that name. Um, just so you know, I'm working in a group uh, at Red Hat called the Systems Engineering End-to-End -End Integration Team. And our actual mandate is to work across the the business units um, trying to identify places where our various products or, or uh, uh, components can work better together. Um, and we actually have a group of people whose job it is to do that and to, to work with the various product teams um, and make sure that they keep talking as well. Um, in this case, uh, my, uh, my, my actual task, the reason I'm involved specifically in uh, the OpenShift on OpenStack is that I'm going to be writing a reference implementation document which describes a single layout. I'm going to you know, pick a set of uh, parameters and create one um, as an example. Uh, that paper is due sometime this spring, hopefully early, but maybe a little later. Um, and in that capacity, I've been working with the OpenShift on OpenStack engineering team and as well with the OpenShift engineers and the OpenStack engineers to try and unify all of our efforts in this area. Um, so sometimes I find myself in learning mode, sometimes I find myself in teaching mode, uh, sometimes I find myself in collaboration and management mode. Um, with all of those things with the goal being to produce something that works uh, that combines the components in the in the best possible way. Um, I'm assuming that everybody here is familiar with, uh, you know, certainly with OpenShift, but at least to some degree with cloud services like OpenStack. Um, if you're familiar with OpenStack, then you're going to be aware that uh, it basically provides virtualized machines and network software-defined uh, components that 10 years ago or less would have been purely done on bare metal and would have been managed completely. And if you look at OpenShift, you could say, why are you even, you know, what is there to integrate? It runs fine on bare metal. Why wouldn't it run fine in a service like this? And the answer is it really does. Um, but it turns out that there are some of the virtual services that, um, there are services that Open OpenStaff can offer that, OpenShift can take advantage of if it's aware that they're there, and a certain amount of awareness is necessary to make uh, to take the best advantage of them. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about four areas: installation, networking, storage, and identity management. Um, these are the areas where it looks like, uh, or where it seems obvious that uh, integration, tight integration, would be the most useful. And it turns out that in some of the cases, your intuition is right, and in others, it's not so much yet. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the three service areas 
Um, in installation, I'm going to leave aside for a moment because that's uh, that's purely uh, something that OpenStack does. Um, but uh, as far as the integration services, um, networking, storage, and identity management are the areas where it seems most likely that some kind of uh, communication between the two services makes sense. Um, and when I when I say that, what I really mean, when I'm talking about integration, what I'm talking about is a situation where, for some reason, OpenShift actually needs to be aware in some way that it's running on OpenStack when it's configured or, or during operations, or cases where OpenStack needs to be aware, uh, and this is less less an issue, but OpenStack needs to be aware that it's working with OpenShift. Um, there have been a couple of cases where w there are features we want uh, in OpenStack that OpenShift could use. That's not generally the case. More we're focusing on how to configure OpenShift so that it can take advantage of things specifically and that it actually has to know that it's dealing with OpenStack. Um, uh, I'll get into how each of these uh, how the integration happens in a minute, but um, just as a general thing for the networking, um, OpenStack has a couple of different software-defined network me uh, mechanisms, um, OVS and GRE, which normally are under the uh, under the hood um, for systems that are working on top. And we're looking at whether or not and how the networking could be improved for OpenShift by taking advantage of elements of Neutron. Um, in the block storage area, it's a little more obvious. Uh, when you're running OpenShift on bare metal, you probably have some kind of uh, shared backing storage, uh, some kind of shared block storage, uh, so that your components are uh, you know, have persistence and, if necessary, have shared storage. In OpenStack, the service that provides block storage is Cinder. Um, now, something to be aware of is Cinder is really kind of an abstraction layer, so Cinder can have behind it um, a number of different storage mechanisms, and I'll, I'll cover those uh, in a little more detail later as well. The identity management uh, component is a part where you want to have, you're going to, each of these services has their own user base, and um, what you really want is for uh, ideally for the users of both where they need to use both to have the same uh, username password system and ideally uh, single sign-on but that's not something that we're actually working on at this point um, right now we're looking at uh, merely making sure that they have the same credentials the same user the same password um, so that for two reasons. First, so that the users have simplicity, and second, so that the administrators of, of OpenShift and OpenStack, if they need to identify a user, it's the same identifier on both systems, um, and that they don't need to be managed separately. Um, now back to the installation piece. Uh, this does assume, I'm, I'm talking primarily about uh, installation of OpenShift on OpenStack, which means that I'm assuming that you have a working OpenStack environment um, with heat enabled. I assume that it has, uh, we're working with OSP7 now. Um, OSP8 is released. I'm not sure the timeline, I didn't check that, um, but we're not developing against OSP8 yet. I don't think there'll be any upgrade issues, but you never know. Um, the assumption is that Cinder is there and that Cinder is backed by some kind of network file service. And this is, as I was saying, uh, Cinder can serve in OpenStack uh, from a number of backing services, whether they're network services like Ceph and Gluster and NFS, or uh, iSCSI, which is also a network file service, but which actually attaches at a block layer rather than uh, being a service above. Um, and it assumes and we'll talk about this later, this setting assumes that the Keystone OpenStack service is backed by an LDAP service, so that Keystone is not using its own internal database for user management. Um, that's going to give you the best uh, set of capabilities, the best um, management tools, because LDAP has uh, well-known management tools. Um, and if you're using an LDAP service in general, as long as the schemas uh, match uh, for authentication, you should be able to bind 
both of them to the same LDAP service. Um, OpenShift has a set of requirements to run which come outside of the installation as well. Um, in this case, uh, the assumption is that you're going to have uh, either pre-allocated or at least the capability of having a floating IP from OpenStack, which is going to be used for inbound connections from the OpenShift customers. Um, it needs also needs to be published using uh, a wildcard DNS record. Uh, people who've deployed OpenShift 3 are going to be familiar with this, so um, it shouldn't be, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, A lot of what I'm going to be talking about, and I, I, my slides are actually a little out of order, so I may end up jumping a little bit as I go. Um, much of what I'm going to be talking about is the, the heat stack deployment, because the goal here is to have uh, a heat template which uh, encapsulates all of these pieces um, so that when you're doing the deployment, taking advantage of the OpenStack uh, components, you don't need to manipulate those components directly. You should be able to pass all of the parameters that you want um, directly to the heat stack, and it should do all the setup for you. Um, the heat stack itself, if you're, uh, you know, I'm again, I'm assuming that you're familiar with heat. Um, the, the heat stack takes, oops, I have a typo there, two dots. Um, the heat stack takes a set of parameters which uh, customize your deployment, and um, those are provided through a YAML file, which is provided at the heat invocation. Um, I'll show an example of that in a moment. Um, what you're seeing on this slide are the, the kind of the standard parameters uh, that you'd need to use to run the OpenShift heat stack. With these parameters, you get kind of a naive installation. Um, you can tweak some of them to your own. You can select weather image. But if you use just these parameters, you should get an OpenShift service that doesn't take any particular advantage of uh, OpenStack resources. Um, I'm going to be covering the, the things you can add to that in a moment. Um, as I said, I think I'm going to jump around a little bit because I want to get to the invocation. If you were going to use that uh, that file, it would be saved as env.yaml. Oops. I don't think I can highlight that. Okay. Um, this is an invocation and a couple of uh, samples for the heat stack create. It creates a stack called OSE, has a timeout of, I think, 180 minutes. Um, the parameters that you saw in the first uh, parameter slide there are in the env.yaml file. You notice that the, the minus E indicates that those are things to replace uh, environment variables or parameters. The second argument I'm using in this case because I'm building uh, a fairly small, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not building an HA. There, I'll get in a little bit to uh, some stock variables that you can use, stock uh, environment variables um, that are provided. So this env.single, I'll show you in, in a couple of minutes, it basically says don't create uh, a load balancer, just mock up the, the load balancer. So I, this is disabling load balancing. Um, the final line of the invocation, the minus F option, is the entry point to the stack. Uh, that file is the, the actual entry point to the template. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of details of what's inside those. Uh, I will point you at the GitHub for those. Um, once you start the stack, the stack create is asynchronous. So the second invocation shows you uh, how to see that your stack is started. In this case, I uh, pulled this up this morning, so it claims that the stack creation is complete, um, but you can see how long it took to execute. Um, you'd see create and process in the creation time um, if that weren't true. And, oh, these are actually two different stacks, great. Um, and the final invocation there, I'm not gonna show because it's uh, a large output, um, but it would show 
the the current status of the stack as it's executing and what resources are part of it. Um, so I want to go back. This shows that the as the stack is running, as the stack is executing, um, this is a, a create sample from what you'd see in Horizon as the stack's creating. Um, you can see the components being created and the grayed out one there in the middle is uh, uh, a set of nodes being created. Um, when you run the stock OpenShift uh, heat stack, you'll see something like this. You'll see a, 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 an additional network and router and you'll see the nodes that the, the stack will create. Um, some of those will be OpenShift master hosts. If you're doing HA, you'll have multiple ones of those, and then you'll definitely have multiple, um, definitely have multiple compute nodes. Um, again, here's a list of the of the hosts that are created by the stack. Um, again, I made this snapshot this morning uh, rather than last night after a run through, so you can see it's not uh, in progress. But this gives you an idea of what you'll sh what you'll see. Um, in this case, you'll see uh, an internal name server and um, a single master node and, or master host and two node hosts for OpenShift. Uh, let me just check. Okay, that's what I was wanted to get into. I was, wanted to start talking about the various integration points before I sh try to show uh, what the invocations will look like. Um, for networking, OpenShift has a component called the OpenShift SDN. And what the OpenShift SDN service does, it's a standard OpenShift uh, uh, component, and it provides the communications between the, the nodes, the compute nodes, and uh, also between the containers and pods that are, that are hosted on them. Um, by default, if you turn on the OpenShift SDN, I believe what you get is um, I believe what you get is an open v switch uh, network uh, underneath flannel. If you just say yes, I believe you get an o uh, uh, an OVS network. Um, if you say flannel, if you specify that the OpenShift SDN should be flannel, it creates uh, it creates a flannel network using the host gateway mode. Now, the host gateway mode for flannel is, uh, flannel actually uses OVS underneath it as well. And Neutron uses OVS underneath it uh, in most common installations. And there's some question about the performance of a virtualized network layered over the top of a second virtualized network. It works. Um, I don't have numbers. I'm hoping to get this set up uh, and hand a, a couple of identical configurations over to some of our performance people who can compare the actual uh, network performance between uh, uh, what we call a vert on vert network or one using flannel with the host gateway mode. Um, the host gateway mode is much simpler. The, the routing is uh, essentially a lookup table, so there's, there's very little um, routing logic being executed as a packet's received and encapsulated. The you know, disadvantage from a generalized networking standpoint is that the host gateway mode requires a single broadcast domain for all the participants, where uh, uh, an OVS network is complete networking and can manage routing as well as, uh, as switching. So the integration here, if you were gonna look at this, these are the options we have set up right now for OpenShift on OpenStack using the heat templates. Um, now, so there is the possibility, we looked at the possibility of trying to use uh, Neutron directly and various things led us to not uh, seeing that as the best option. There is an, uh, an option to um, to Neutron, which is going to be supposedly available in the next release, called um, uh, VLAN Aware VMs. If when that service is available in OpenStack, uh, we might reconsider what the the recommended option is because that will allow us to add um, 
isolation to the networks that is not there yet or is not very strong yet. So while this, this flannel with the host gateway mode is the current uh, recommended configuration, we're going to continue to look at other options. Now, let me see if I can scan back. This one I actually have. This is a fairly simple, I was showing you the, the parameters. Um, if you want to enable uh, OpenShift, OpenShift SDN with Flannel, um, I hate kind of saying simply do things, but in this case it really is. You add a single argument to those environments um, and set the OpenShift SDN parameter to the word Flannel. Um, this will cause the heat stack to, um, to pass down the arguments necessary to implement Flannel across the various uh, nodes. Um, I'm going to back up once more because I wanted to show here um, something to, that I skipped in the installation part was that um, we're implementing this as heat only in the sense that the person doing the installation only needs um, to feed arguments to heat. They don't need to, to mess around with any other services. But um, one of the features of heat is that it's very good. It's very it's it's designed for managing OpenStack, um, and it has mechanisms for passing arguments down to run on the VMs. Um, we're using Ansible as the definition for how to do the actual VM configuration, and we're using the stock uh, open well stock. We're using the OpenShift Ansible. Uh, uh, playbooks which are provided, which are, are being built by the OpenShift team. And this is one of the cases where uh, I think there have been a couple of instances where the developers of the OpenShift on OpenStack template have talked to the OpenShift Ansible people and said, we would like this feature added to OpenShift Ansible. Um, and I'm pretty sure the Cinder is one of the areas where they've done that. So when you're executing the stack, it's important to be aware that uh, heat is, uh, is creating the infrastructure in OpenStack, and then it's invoking Ansible on the VMs uh, so that Ansible will continue the process of doing the configuration. Um, and both of these are areas where people could do, um, could potentially contribute and certainly can look and see what the behaviors are um, for these, for the services. Um, in this case, uh, the Ansible playbook that you would run, if you were manually running this Ansible playbook, you would specify in the Ansible parameters that you give it, please create me uh, an OpenShift SDN and do it using Flannel. And those arguments are merely passed through to the Ansible playbooks. Um, some of that is true in others as well. So networking is one of the cases where um, we looked at making direct use of uh, of Neutron, but so far um, using Flannel or, or a service like that for OpenShift has uh, appeared to be a better option. Uh, the second area that I've talked about is, is uh, persistent storage and block storage. Again, uh, the, the goal is to control it all using heat. So uh, there are parameters that um, that I'll have to look up in this case, that um, you can pass, you just tell it, give it an argument that says enable Cinder. Um, you also need to give, in this case, uh, a set of OpenStack credentials. Um, and I'll have to add these to the slides later. I didn't manage to get them all in. Um, but if you're gonna enable Cinder in OpenShift, what this does, uh, let me go cover the use cases. There's three use cases where, that we've identified that you'd want to use Cinder and, uh, for OpenShift. Um, the first is that each of the nodes has a set of Docker containers, and rather than having that storage allocated from uh, the VM's ephemeral storage, you could potentially want to, um, to allocate that from uh, the varlib docker storage, the actual container storage from some block storage system. Um, that would allow you to rebind it later to, uh, 
to another instance if you were going to share that information. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that uh, as a desired use case, but at least the, the capability is there to use uh, additional storage or to use uh, uh, permanent storage, persistent storage instead of the ephemeral storage in uh, in the VM. The second one is more important because you definitely want persistent storage for it. OpenShift uh, can provide its own internal registry, and I think I think it requires it for most operation. Um, when it does builds, it will it will place any new images you create into the OpenShift registry, and that registry is actually run inside uh, the OpenShift network so that it's available to the to the nodes when they start up new containers. You definitely want persistent storage for those uh, final images and intermediate intermediate images. Um, when you specify the uh, that you want to have an OpenShift registry and you specify that Cinder should be enabled, the OpenShift registry will be created and it will use Cinder storage and that storage will be automatically created. The the volume, the Cinder volume will be created. Uh, by the stack and it will be mounted onto the registry host and it will be bound into the registry uh, into the registry service. So that's a second case where Cinder offers a benefit over a naive installation. The final one is actually for OpenShift applications. This one's less automatic right now because OpenShift doesn't currently have the means for a user to create volumes in underlying services, uh, any any persistent volumes that OpenShift is aware of uh, have to be created before they're provided. Um, now the way this works is that, and this is why the we'll talk about later the uh, unified uh, identification uh, identity management will be useful because the user will log into their uh, OpenStack account and they can create a Cinder volume there and they can retrieve the Cinder volume ID. That will, you know, OpenStack creates the volume, provides the uh, the ID. When the user goes to create uh, a, a new service in OpenShift, they're going to provide that volume ID uh, and specify that the volume, the exterior volume to be mounted is a Cinder volume. Um, Underneath, uh, Kubernetes will receive this, and Kubernetes can interact with Cinder on each of the nodes. It will, Kubernetes will mount uh, the specified volume onto the node wherever the, the container is starting, and then also bind that into the container when it starts. Um, and the, the last bullet here is a, a place where um, the, there's documentation for the user behaviors that uh, the users have to, to manage to enable uh, to enable storage in their containers. Um, the best of my knowledge, there's I, I don't know of any plans at this point to uh, to make OpenShift aware of uh, underlying ephemeral or excuse me underlying storage services, but I wouldn't count that out. We're not I, this is not part of our focus right now. This is going to be the behavior as it stands. Um, there are options to pass in. I don't have them in the slides right now. I'm going to be adding them uh, when this is done. Uh, right now, the Cinder uh, the Cinder behavior is not committed to the master branch and the OpenShift in, uh, on OpenStack, and uh, it may be shifting a little, which is part of the reason I didn't include it. Um, but I'll be including those in the slides and the links at the bottom. Will, will lead to the uh, GitHub repo where the source code is. Um, like we talked about common identity a moment ago. If a, a Cinder user is creating uh, a volume and then mounting that into their OpenShift uh, containers, it would be nice if those resources were identified using the same name and ideally using the same username and password and even more ideally managed in a single location so that the people managing the, the user base for the two services can do that in a single place. Um, OpenShift and OpenStack 
uh, through the use of an LDAP database can share user information. Um, it turns out that OpenShift can actually use the Keystone internal database, but that's not really a desirable uh, mechanism because uh, it, but Keystone has its own user, user management. It would mean that the OpenStack uh, administrators would have to uh, know about the OpenShift users and uh, and manage those users as well. And there may be uh, there may be users who don't need that. And so putting that on the OpenStack uh, administrators to manage that user database uh, probably isn't the best choice. Uh, the ideal solution is to have Keystone use an external LDAP database. That way, uh, OpenShift, which uses right now uses an Apache uh, uh, server as its front end, both for the the web interface and for the uh, the rest interface that apache server can also bind using the standard uh, mod ldap mod auth ldap x uh, module to the same ldap server with the same credentials and um, then both keystone and uh, and openshift can use the same user database at this point they're still just using the same user database um, I believe that the the access policies still have to be managed on either side, but that makes sense because uh, the OpenStack and OpenShift uh, administrators are going to be able to set their usage policies independently of each other. All, all they need is the presence of a user to be able to do that that policy management. Um, again, I don't think I have. Yeah, see, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get in here. This is where I was going to put the, the actual parameters, and I will put them in the slides so that you can see what they are and, and have pointers to them as well. Um, so the, the point here is that uh, I'd really like you to take a look at some of the stuff. Um, try it out. Tell us what's working, what's not working, what you'd like to see. Uh, the GitHub repo is public. Um, you can configure your own. You can do a stack create and watch what happens. Um, feel free to you know, put in issues and pull requests. Um, at the bottom, finally, here's the locations of the OpenShift on OpenStack GitHub and the OpenShift Ansible playbooks. Um, there's also references here to uh, configuring and using Cinder on OpenShift uh, when you're when they're not integrated. These should be um, included in the heat templates when they're done. And I will add links uh, to these various references at the end. Um, and at this point, I guess I'll open things up for questions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I I know this it's a lot to cover. Um, and Judd's asking that, that he didn't hear much about DNS and how is naming handled and is anything automated? Um, the stack as it stands right now creates a DNS server, uh, which is used primarily for the demos. Um, DNS is a publication service. So for the heat stack to modify uh, external DNS isn't really doesn't really make sense and that was why earlier on I noted that um, one of the requirements is that you have or are able to um, to get the wildcard DNS uh, for the inbound uh, inbound router the um, there Scott's got something there yeah Scott just yeah. just made a note so if you're going to deploy this for real uh, the way the way OpenShift 3 manages the IPs is that um, it has its own DNS. It needs to be uh, that DNS needs to be delegated, or uh, actually, I don't think it's delegated. I think the wildcard DNS will uh, point to a single A record, so that all IP addresses which OpenShift provides uh, will be pointed to that A record, which is then uh, a router. Uh, a load balancer will just accept the packets and behind that is a router that'll distribute them to the containers. Um, 
that's it's been a while since I looked at the DNS, the actual DNS setup for OpenShift 3. So uh, I I am ready to stand corrected if that's the case. But uh, other than establishing a place where uh, the OpenShift can add records using DNS mask um, to the to the existing service. Um, the outbound publication is still not automated. So um, both Judd and Scott, um, I'm, uh, un if you unmute yourself, you can ask questions verbally. I mean, something to, something to be aware of is that there's really two issues here. One is that is that OpenShift needs to be able to add uh, add records so that uh, the the applications it has uh, will be available, will be published. Um, but DNS is hierarchical and DNS uh, requires the cooperation of someone upstream uh, to publish things. So that that uh, wildcard record still has to be established by someone with the authority to do that. If you just create an OpenShift service and say, here's my, uh, my fully qualified DNS name for the, the root of my service, but you don't have an agreement with someone to publish that, you're still not going to get it. And that's that's a feature of DNS. That's a fact of DNS. Um, using the wildcard makes that a little bit easier because I believe that it, it allows the creation of a single record once um, as opposed to um, delegation and then updating, which requires continual updating each time. In OpenShift 2, uh, each time you created an application, it required updating uh, a DNS service, the, uh, the actual zone records. I don't think that's true with, with OpenShift 3. Yeah, it's not, Mark. So for OpenShift v3, we just need to create a wildcard DNS entry in the uh, zone file for the, um, for the zone that, that covers OpenShift. And then any application that gets created will uh, dynamically prepend its uh, uh, host name for the app to that that record and uh, be resolvable. Um, yep. Hey, Judd, Judd, I'm curious as to what you mean by can etcd or or uh, console perform these uh, tasks? You're, is that related to your DNS question? What are you referring to there? Yeah, one of the great features of console is that it's also a DNS server. So as you're mm -hmm. creating nodes, whether they be containers or virtual machines, um, the really the state machine, the, the great database, distributed database brains of the whole orchestration operation also manages all the naming and is listening on 53 UDP and all that. Mm -hmm. And so you could potentially, instead of using DNS mask or what have you, and the potential points of failure with DNS mask um, or a bind server, um, just leverage what you got in etcd or console to provide uh, that all the naming necessary within the wildcard. Yeah, so we, we haven't taken a look at that yet, but I think at the end of the day, what the requirements are is for us to be able to update some DNS service uh, with the dynamic host names that are being generated for the VMs that are deployed onto the OpenStack environment. Now, we can we can do a heat stack query after the uh, environment has been deployed and pull uh, certain parameters out of that based on pre-configured values from the stack that was created. And if if you want to inject those into your console uh, DNS uh, service or into your bind, uh, you know, DDNS uh, uh, update mechanisms in your production network, then that's something that could certainly be considered and evaluated. But, but right now we haven't taken a look at uh, whether or not etcd or console can look at that. However, I'll add it to the uh, to-do list to take a look at later. Thanks. It might just save you a big step, you know, sure. and there is a nice distributed database. Absolutely. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Uh, are there any other questions on the on the call? Add them into the chat. We can do that. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, ATCD services from OpenShift, so how it is going to coordinate with the DNS? Uh, 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 I know from the open stack. So what is the exact uh, uh, correlation with that when any container spins up in OpenShift? So uh, that's a rash, correct? Arvind. Yeah. Arvind. 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 Oh, okay, Arvind, sorry. Um, 
You, you were really breaking up there, and I couldn't quite make out the question. I was asking because I wonder if it uh, corresponded to the question in the chat window. No, my question is related to the ECD services, which will be used by OpenShift, how it is going to coordinate with the DNS uh, uh, services at uh, OpenStack layer, when any container spawns up. Sorry, Diane, could you could you make that? Perhaps you could just type that into the chat channel and I'll try to answer it. Yeah, yeah sure. And then yeah. there's a there's a, while you're typing that, I'm going to take a look at the other question in the chat. So if someone might get OSP running by Cola, uh, would it be possible to deploy the OpenShift environment on top of this environment? Um, right now, uh, as of the 311 release for OpenShift, uh, we do have support for deploying OpenShift in, in containers. And in fact, we have been working on a feature via this heat stack uh, deployment that will allow you to deploy OpenShift in containers on top of an atomic enterprise host on top of the open uh, open stack environment. So uh, provided your, you know, uh, uh, Cola is kind of orthogonal to that. We, we do have OpenShift running in containers that can take advantage of our entire, you know, atomic kind of ecosystem, if you will, for containers, which includes the atomic host itself. So I don't see why running OpenShift 7 via Cola would prevent you from launching the heat stack uh, in this manner um, right now. I, I think it would work fine. Okay, and we're just waiting for Arvind to type his question into the chat. Here we go. How etcd service coordinate with DNS services on OpenStack? How does etcd service coordinate with DNS services on OpenStack? Um, right now, they're functioning as independent entities, and the DNS services or, or etcd services with, within OpenShift are just used for the OpenShift um, requirements for uh, keeping state on the OpenShift side. Um, they're not currently correlated to the DNS services on OpenStack right now. These are all great questions, um, and I'm really pleased with, with um, the conversation. Are there any others um, out there? Absolutely, so I, and, and if you guys have any feedback or, or um, want to discuss these, let's uh, let's please do so. This is this is great stuff, Diane. Thanks for coordinating. All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for jumping in there, and Mark for getting this. Oops, there's one more question here. I'm going to sneak it in for Judd. Is is LDAP a blocker? Yeah. If I don't have an LDAP backend for my for um, for Keystone, uh, I can still deploy. Right. None of none of our deployments are have LDAP backends that we know of. Absolutely, you no, can still do. No. Uh, you're, yes, you can do what you want to do. Um, the you can also, I believe, um, still unify the the um, the authentication, the identity management, but your capabilities are going to be more limited using Keystone than it would be if both were using LDAP. Sure. Your capabilities outside for things other than OpenShift on OpenStack. And, and mm -hmm. Judd, in addition to that, like if you're just deploying OpenShift on top of take any provider, for example, and you're not doing any LDAP uh, uh, integration, you can still log into that OpenShift host and configure it to authenticate however you want, whether that's using um, wide open for a proof of concept uh, purposes or whether or not you're setting up HT password authentication on it. Uh, nothing prevents you from doing any of that. We're just trying to make integrating into your existing LDAP infrastructure easier if you do have it. One of the reasons I love Red Hat. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm the old Netscape guy, and I, I sold a lot of Red Hat. I sold a lot of LDAP, and I built some big LDAP systems. So, mm -hmm. yay. LDAP. Awesome. All right, I'll pause again. Anyone else have any other questions? All righty then, going, going once, going twice. There's real easy ways to get a hold of Mark on Gmail, GitHub, Freenode, um, IRC channel. Whoops, there comes another one. All right, here it comes. I knew they would sneak one in. 
Arvind is asking, will C groups at OpenStack have any impact with C groups at nodes running on OpenShift? Hmm. I have to think yeah. about that. I, yeah. I don't think from the standpoint, the, the, the C groups of the VM where OpenShift is running should be distinct from the C groups on mm -hmm. the OpenStack compute nodes. Now, if the OpenStack compute node has somehow limited the uh, the VM uh, process capabilities, uh, resource usage, then it would affect the entire node. It would f affect each, you know, basically the C group on uh, on the OpenStack compute node would say limit OpenStack VMs to this much. Um, that would limit everything on each node. It wouldn't be. Uh, I'm. I'm. I think they're distinct. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah that, thanks. I think that, that that does make sense. I think that might be something we have to go and double check on too. Just. And, and, and that actually makes a certain amount of sense because, yeah, I mean, the, the OpenStack uh, resource management um, really should probably be distinct from the OpenShift resource management. Okay. We may need a little bit more insight into that. That'll be, I think, another topic for a blog post someday. Um, Side commentary by someone like Dan Wall or somebody. Yeah. Fun, fun folks here. So, um, again, thank you very much, Mark and Scott. And um, we will post the slides. Um, we'll give Mark another day or two to finish his links and fill in some of the blanks. But um, the slides will go out on the OpenShift Commons mailing list. I'll send a link to that and we'll update and put this recording up on briefings. So we'll be back again next week. And next week we're doing identity management. Um, so there'll be some good questions there. Take care and thanks again. Thank you.